Let's pray together. God, we thank you for this opportunity to come together. I pray that your presence would meet with us here. Thank you for this opportunity to worship. I pray you'd be with those of us gathered here and those who uh, are gathered in their homes and across the internet today, and I just pray that you would meet with us. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. So when Karen was in college, um, when she would go to church a lot of Sundays, the music director would, stay, would say, stand as we sing hymn number such and such to the tune of hymn number such and such. Um, and I've not done that very often, but there are some interchangeable melodies. Um, one that I had thought of, and Melody mentioned it this morning as well, is, uh, and now you're going to get this stuck in your mind, so I'm sorry for that, but you can sing the song Amazing Grace to the tune of the theme from Gilligan's Island. It does work, trust me. Um, so, um, there, the, but there are several interchangeable tunes, and at the, at, at the back of the hymn book, it does give you some opportunities for those things. So the song that we're going to be singing is Oh to Be Like Thee, uh, but the tune that we're going to be singing is uh, more familiar to you, the, the tune to Glorious Freedom. So we are going to stand now and sing the hymn Oh to Be Like Thee to the tune of Glorious Freedom. Oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer, this is my constant longing and prayer. Gladly I'll forfeit all of earth's treasures, Jesus thy perfect likeness to wear. Oh, to be like thee, oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer, pure as thou art. Come in thy sweetness, come in thy fullness, stand thine own image deep on my heart. Oh, to be like thee, full of compassion, loving, forgiving, tender and kind, helping the helpless, cheering the fainting, seeking the wandering sinner to find. Oh, to be like thee, holy in spirit, holy and harmless, patient and brave, meekly enduring, cruel reproaches, willing to suffer others to save. Oh, to be like thee, oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer, pure as thou art, come in thy sweetness. Come in thy fullness, send thine own image, sleep on my heart. Oh, to be like thee, Lord, I am coming, now to receive anointing divine. All that I am and have I am bringing, Lord, from this moment all shall be thine. Oh, to be like thee, while I am pleading. Pour out thy spirit, fill with thy love. Make me a temple, plead for thy dwelling. Fit me for life and heaven above. Oh, to be like thee, oh, to be like thee. Blessed Redeemer, pure as thou art. Come in thy sweetness, come in thy fullness. Stand thine own image. Deep on my heart. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah. Louder than the unbelief, I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from 
are higher. You know just what I need. I trust you, Jesus. You see what I cannot see. Your ways are higher. You know just what I need. I trust you, Jesus. You see what I cannot see. Your ways are higher. You know just what I need. I trust you, Jesus. You see what I cannot see. Your ways are higher. You know just what I need. I trust you, Jesus. You see what I cannot see. I don't want to miss one word you speak. Everything you say is life to me. I don't want to miss one word you speak. Quiet my heart, I'm earth has quaked before, moved by the sound of his voice. Seas that are shaken and stirred can be calmed and broken for my regard. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all, through it all, it is are on you and it is well with me far be it from me to not believe even when my eyes can't see and this mountain that's in front of me thrown into the midst of the sea through it all through it all my eyes are on you through it all through it all it is well through it all through it all my eyes are on you and it is well it is well so let go my soul and trust in him the waves and wind still know his name so let go my soul and trust in him the waves and wind still know his name so let go my soul and trust in him the waves and wind
Joseph is coming to lead us in prayer. Um, our students are returning to SNU this week. Classes begin uh, this week. Want to pray for them. Uh, Cooper and others going to UCA. Allie Melton going to UCA. They're moving next weekend. And so college starting up, other schools starting up soon. But we are honored to have Joseph with us today, and he's going to lead us in prayer, and then he's going to uh, bring the word. Uh, 2020 graduate of Nazarene Theological Seminary, and uh, we are proud to call you a, an always Cornerstonian, um, but uh, we are honored to have you today to share the word with us. Would you lead us in prayer at this time? God, thank you for this time that you've given us together today. for all of the blessings that you pour out into our lives. Help us, God, open our hearts, open our ears, and open our minds to receive your word this day. Help us to recognize the blessings that you pour out into our lives and help us to pass those blessings on to others, to let your blessing and let your love flow through us. Thank you, God. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, it is definitely good to be with you all this morning. Let me make sure that this is secured properly. Um, this morning, I am going to do something a little ambitious, uh, and I'm wanting to give our message out of the whole book of 1 Corinthians, because I think that sometimes it is helpful to um, understand more of the context um, than just specific passages. Uh, but with that being said, I am going to start us off by reading 1 Corinthians um, chapter 8, if you want to look that up and read with me. Hear the word of our Lord. Now, about food sacrifice to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know. But the man who loves God is known by God. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, Yet for us, there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. But not everyone knows this. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat such food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to an idol. And since their conscience is weak, they are destroyed. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat, and we are no better if we do. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone with a weak conscience sees you, who have this knowledge, eating in an idol's temple, won't he be emboldened to eat what has been sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against your brothers in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause him to fall. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Today, I want to share a story about context. Sometimes it's hard for us to understand context. That's why I love learning languages, because language is the way that other people think. And so it's a part of their context. For example, in Spanish, you would say, la mesa roja, the table red. In Spanish, the noun comes first, mesa, the table, 
and the adjective comes second, roja, red. In English, it's the opposite, the red table. This is because in Spanish, the most important thing to mention is the noun, the thing itself. Then you can comment on what distinguishes it, adjectives that mark it from other similar nouns. But in English, we think it's more important to identify which table. So we first say the adjective, red. It's crazy, but little things like this add up to influence the way people think about everything. Um, one philosopher once said, language is the boundary lines of your world. And that's very true. Spanish was the second language that I ever learned. And it's good that I chose to learn Spanish because it helped me to get in good with my wife, Celeste, who is Hispanic. But in my high school Spanish class, uh, my teacher told us a story about context and about how other people think. Her friend had got to know another girl whose family only spoke Spanish. But she knew some Spanish, so when she went over to their house, she was able to communicate here and there. She was helping them cook, and then they ate afterwards. The mom teased her by telling her she had eaten a lot, and she responded sheepishly, saying, Soy embarazado. Now, after this, her friend's mom would no longer invite her to their house, and her mom told her friend to stop hanging out with her. The girl didn't know what she had done to offend her friend's family. After finally getting a chance to question her friend, she realized what had happened. Soy embarazado, in our context, really sounds like that means, I am embarrassed. But in Spanish, this is a false cognate. Soy embarazado means, I am pregnant. <laughs> And this is why context is so important. We can get in trouble when we start guessing. It really just takes one word to change the meaning of things. And I think we frequently fall for this sort of thing, even while reading the Bible. We forget that the Bible is a translation too. We have an unfortunate habit of taking a single verse out of context. And a lot of times we do this in order to agree with how we already think about things. For example, I know people whose favorite verse in the Bible is Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That sounds so positive, so easy. I can get that job interview. I can get that raise. I can win that game, that contest. I can do it because I'm a Christian. Rah, 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 win. This verse seems to support our cultural narrative of victory, but only because it's out of context. Let's back up a few verses because Paul says, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This has a very different meaning now that it's put back into context. Paul is saying, whatever I do, whatever happens to me, I can do it through Christ. I can live through Christ, my strength. This is not a narrative of victory. It is a narrative of strength, Christ's strength. But for us, it's a narrative of loss, according to the world. It's a narrative of weakness. Paul says this while imprisoned, and he also says, Rejoice in the Lord. I will say it again. Rejoice. This isn't about money or success or winning. This isn't even saying that everything works out for Christians. We can only make it say this when we take this verse out of context. We do this often. Sometimes we just slightly shift the focus. Other times we try to say the complete opposite thing. But I think that we never pick the good ones. <laughs> I think if we're going to take verses out of context, I'm surprised we don't pick some juicier ones. <laughs> go big or go home, right? Ecclesiastes 7.16 says, Do not be too righteous and do not be too wise. I mean, come on, that's good, right? If we're going to take things out of context, why would we bother? We're all going to die. Let's enjoy life. Let's basically be good, but not try too hard. Or even better, four times in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, everything is permissible for me. I mean, that's basically free license to do anything, right? Everything is permissible for me. Stop playing video games. Everything is permissible for me. Uh, stop hanging out with bad friends. Everything is permissible for me. Stop your anger, your apathy, your false allegiances. Everything is permissible for me. When I jump to extreme examples like this, we can see, and honestly, these are also verses that we don't read too often, uh, but through these, we can see why this is such a problem, taking things out of context, why context is so important. 
we don't get to make up the meaning of verses in the Bible. We also don't get to quickly assume that we know the meaning just because it sounds easy to understand um, in English. We have to be aware of the context. We don't get to take things out of context. The Bible is a very big book, 66 books. And it says a whole lot of things. We've, throughout history, we've used the Bible to justify slavery, to fight slavery, to justify sexism, to fight sexism, to support Republicans, to support Democrats, on and on and on. The Bible is often used to support and attack all sorts of arguments. And that's because instead of listening to God speak into our lives through this text, letting it change us, we read the things that sound intuitive to us, that support what we already believe. We read what we can use to attack and control others. And that's scary because at that point, we shut our ears and our hearts to the ways that God is challenging us through this text. Everything is permissible for me. We don't want the Bible to change us too much. We don't want, to, we don't want it to hold us accountable. We don't want anyone to hold us accountable. Everything is permissible for me. We don't want to be kept from our freedoms We have the final say in our lives, in our reading of this text. And because I can tell myself that I am right, everything is permissible for me. Again, this verse comes from 1 Corinthians. So let's not be dangerous with it. Let's put it back into context. Um, I think that the book of 1 Corinthians can speak a whole lot into a host of situations that we're encountering today. Um, because we focus on single verses or even small passages, we sometimes find it hard to see the bigger picture of the letter or the book that we're reading. In 1 Corinthians, Paul is trying to address the issues of divisions and freedom in the Corinthian church. That's what the whole book is about, divisions and freedom. You see, in the Corinthian church, there were divisions. There were actually a set of different divisions that that Paul tells us about, and some that he just hints at, and we don't even know what they are. There are also different schools of thought in this church. We don't know what all of these different thoughts are either. But some people claimed that they were following Paul's thinking. Other people claimed that they were following Apollos' thinking. Still other people were claiming that they followed Peter's thinking. And finally, some people said, I follow Christ's thinking. The ultimate trump card, I follow Christ. (laughs) Um... That's a very bold claim. And this last group, uh, let's just pause here for a minute. Do we argue like this today? Maybe we think that they couldn't be a Christian because they're a Democrat. They couldn't be a Christian because they're a Republican. I follow Christ, so my thoughts are the right thoughts. My party is the right party. My stance is the right stance. But this isn't how Christ thinks. It is how the Pharisees think, though. Because of their disagreements with Jesus, uh, they, they tell Jesus, we are God's children. And Jesus says, no, you are not. Not when you're acting like this. And then and another time, they called Jesus a demon, literally demonized him, and said he was the son of Satan because he was healing people and casting out demons. Do we demonize people that we disagree with? I've heard people call President Obama the Antichrist, and I've heard people call President Trump the Antichrist. But honestly, if we follow Jesus today, I think Democrats would think that we are too conservative, and I think that Republicans will think that we are too liberal, because the kingdom of God is too big to fit into one party, or even one country. The vision and scope of the kingdom is too large. It's global. It's universal. When the Pharisees called Jesus a demon for healing the sick and casting out demons, Jesus replied that a divided kingdom would fall. Division is death. For the same reason, the divisions in the Corinthian church were a serious problem. The divisions in our churches are a serious problem. Divisions wherever you find them are a serious problem. Is the literal foundation of your house divided? You better fix that. (laughs) Is your church divided? Let's pray for healing. Are your relationships divided with your spouse, with your parents, with your children? Let's seek God's healing. Is this church, Cornerstone, divided? Let's pray for unity. Is the global church divided? Let's seek the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Is our nation divided? 
Let's come back together before we fall apart. Division is death. Let me give you some context of the divided Corinthian church. There's a group of people who recognize that the gods of the cultures around them were not real. Zeus is not real. Baal is not real. None of them. They would say an idol is nothing at all in this world. They don't exist. There is one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Because there is only one God and these idols don't exist, that meant they were free. They were free to go with their pagan friends to the pagan temples who would sacrifice animals to these pagan gods and offer the meat to the public for free as a form of worship to these gods. Realizing that these idols don't exist, they could go and eat that meat freely. It was just meat. It's just food. It doesn't matter. These idols don't exist, so it's just free food. Everything is permissible for me, they would say. This shouldn't have been a problem, but it was a problem. Other believers, newer in their faith, saw these people eating meat sacrificed to idols. And because of that, they were encouraged to do the same. But in their hearts, this was worshiping the idol. And so their conscience was destroyed by this act. We do this today. We are on guard for our freedoms. Like, like freedom is the ultimate good for us. We can't imagine, imagine limiting our freedom intentionally. But in the Exodus story, do you know that God tells Moses that the sign that God will do what God says he will do is after God has done it and freed them, they will worship God. They will serve God on this mountain. They are freed to be servants. Does that sound familiar? Because one of the major images in Christianity is that we are servants. We are slaves. We serve others and put them first. The greatest is the least. Still, even then, we are like Cain and we ask, am I my brother's keeper? Do I really need to be responsible for other people? We think that we have knowledge of this or that, and even further, we think that knowledge exempts us from the law of holiness and love. Because we have knowledge, because we have truth, we think that we have a right to treat people however we want. But in 1 Corinthians 8, Paul tells us, we know we all possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge. Wow, this is the word of our Lord. First of all, we need to slow down. We all have knowledge. Sometimes we think that we're special, that we're the only ones that have this special knowledge and that it's our mission to beat it into other people. <laughs> and because of that, because we're special, our knowledge exempts us. But that is not the case. We all have knowledge. And once again, the gospel message flips our knowledge on its head. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. This verse has a couple different layers of meaning. Knowledge puffs up. It's like a bouncy castle. It can inflate quickly, but in the end, it doesn't have the substance to it. Love, on the other hand, is more built. It's like a solid building. Love takes its time. Love is harder, but it's worth the effort. Love builds slowly and firmly in relationship. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. This verse also points out that knowledge puffs up internally. Knowledge leads us to pride. We build ourselves up, is the idea. But love is outward. Love builds up, there's no object in this sentence, but the idea is that love builds up others. Love builds up our community, our church. Love builds up the kingdom of God. This is why Paul says anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge. I see this over and over again in social media. Anytime someone tells me about an argument that really upset them on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, I give them the same advice. Do not argue on social media. People are not on social media to learn from you. They want to explain what they know, the same as you. You see, fight after fight This agenda versus that agenda. Wear a mask versus don't wear a mask. Supporting oppressed people versus supporting the community. Like Paul says, 
We all have knowledge. We all have pieces of the truth. But this knowledge puffs us up to be blind to other pieces of the truth. We think that our truth is the whole story, and we don't have room for anything else. We are inflamed, incensed, infuriated that other people won't validate our knowledge. But when we act like this, we prove that we do not yet have the necessary knowledge. And the necessary knowledge is the knowledge of love. The same goes for prophecy. Prophecy is a special type of knowledge. It's a knowledge of foresight and hindsight. Again, without context, we tend to misunderstand prophecy when it, when it appears in the Bible. We think of fortune tellers and of predicting the future and that sort of thing, maybe tea leaves and hand readings. Um, but in the Bible, prophecy is only ever concerned about the present. Prophecy talks about the past, the present, and the future in order to change our actions in the present. God would remind the Israelites of the past so that they would change the present. Remember when this happened. Don't do that again. Look at all the bad stuff that happened afterwards. Remember when this happened. Look how good that was. Do this sort of thing so we can have that good stuff again. That's past prophecy. And here's a good example of it. In Exodus, not all Egyptians owned Hebrew slaves. Not all Egyptians beat Hebrew slaves. Not all Egyptians oppressed Hebrew slaves. But all Egyptians benefited from a society built on Hebrew slavery. And because of that, all Egyptians were punished for it. Today, many of us benefit from the oppression of others, even if we don't participate in it directly. Today, we benefit from sweatshops overseas. We benefit from redlining and employment opportunities. We benefit from the oppression of other people at home and around the world. We need to change how we act. That's past prophecy. Present prophecy explains what is happening right now. In Corinthians, Paul tells them, you are divided and falling apart right now. You are the church. Be the church. Change how you're acting. That's present prophecy. We also have pr future prophecy. Listen, if you keep going down this road, this is what will happen. As an example of future prophecy, if you keep smoking, you will develop breathing problems. And someday, that can develop into chronic illness or cancer. Change how you're acting. That's future prophecy. Prophecy in the Bible is past, present, and future, and it always is to influence the way we act here in the present. Prophecy is a special knowledge, an understanding of how actions are related to consequences and cha how changing those actions will change those consequences. This can be deeply insightful and helpful stuff. And still, Paul tells us that this too is pointless without love. It's very tempting to speak prophetic words to others and to condemn them. Sometimes we can even justify it and say that we're using tough love. But most of the time, deep love is a lot harder than what we call tough love. Tough love is often what we call our anger, our meanness, that originates from caring, true enough. But a lot of times, it stopped being love. Sometimes love is tough, but love is never a means to vent our frustration. Love is not a way to attack our family and our friends. Our prophetic imagination needs to be rooted in long, deep love, or it is pointless. Paul has been talking about knowledge, about wisdom, about prophecy, and about freedom. These all seem like positive things, but when they become the focus, it divided the church. In the climax of the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul shows us a different way of living. Things like knowledge, wisdom, prophecy, and freedom are important, but they are not the end goal. In fact, without love, they are worthless. Truth is not more important than relationships. Knowledge can help us to love more deeply, but when given a choice between the two, we are called to choose love. At the pinnacle of this book about a divided church, Paul says, and now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongue of men and of angels but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor 
and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when wholeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. Notice talking comes before thinking. <laughs> I reason like a child. When I became, when I grew up, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. And for them, mirrors weren't as good as they are for us. But still, in this social distancing time, we recognize that video is not the same as in person. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. But then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. You see, Paul just showed us the most excellent way. This is how we walk with Christ. This, there, there's a great song that we're going to sing in a while that says, they will know we are Christians by our... What is that last word? Is it, is it knowledge? No. Is it freedom? No. Will they know that we're Christians by our independence? By our patriotism? By our prophetic call to justice? By our preaching, by our what? They will know we are Christians by our love. This is the core of our Christian life. We are people of love spreading the good news of peace. Now, I think I need to say that again, and maybe somebody can fill in for my dad and give a woohoo. The core of the Christian life is that we are people of love spreading the good news of peace. As tempting as it is, you can't spew venom and bash people's character into the truth. You can't point to the light using dark words. You can't argue someone into heaven through a Facebook argument. <laughs> That's not how it works. Well, I do believe knowledge is helpful, knowledge is not what gets us to heaven. It is by grace that we are saved, through faith. It is faith in Jesus Christ, faith in the gospel of peace. It is letting the love of God flow through you. In fact, in the early church, the Christian test for whether or not you had the right knowledge was your actions, was your character. That's what made you believable. Today, let's look at our actions, our character and evaluate our knowledge based off of that. I think Pastor Tim has walked us through this exercise before, but I want to do it again. 1 Corinthians 13 gives us a close look at love, and we can use it to reflect on ourselves and our actions. Let's think through this. Imagine you're in that Facebook argument. Imagine you're with that person at work, that family member, that church member, your spouse, your children. Ask yourself if you are being loving and be honest about it. Am I patient? Am I kind? Am I envious? Am I boasting? Am I being proud? Am I being rude? Am I being self-seeking? Am I easily angered? Am I keeping a record of wrongs? Do I delight in evil? In, in the harm that befalls someone else. Maybe I'm mad at them. Ha ha. That was good that that happened to you. Do I delight in evil? Do I rejoice in the truth? Even if it's on the other side. You know, 
Genesis tells us that all humans are created in the image of God. Do we celebrate the goodness that we see in atheists, in homosexuals, in the opposing political side? Do we affirm the image of God in other people? Do we care about them? Do we think that God can speak to us through anyone? Are we listening for God to speak to us? Or are we content to be divided? In 1 Corinthians, Paul points out that the divisions of that church were pointless. Paul planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. Neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. Only God can work God's mission in this world. Even though we're called to participate, that is true. This is God's mission. Go where God has called you, but God will make things grow, not you. It's not on you to hold up this world. It's not on you to set your uncle straight. It's not on you to set your knee straight. Be faithful to where God has called you, for sure. But God makes things grow. An encouraging illustration one of my professors shared with me in college was that ministry is like water dripping on a rock. Sometimes it gets a little frustrating because you don't see a lot of progress. We've been over this a thousand times, rock. (laughs) We've been dripping, dripping, dripping. But if you were to leave and come back after some time, you would see that there is a change in that rock. The water is our love. It's God's love flowing through us. It's not, it's not our truth, our arguments, our emotional reactions. It's not even our good work. The water is our love, God's love. Change takes time, and love takes its time. I've been a student, and I've been a teacher, and I've learned that people will let you speak into their lives if they trust that you love them. Sometimes that love is hard. Sometimes it's hard-earned. And sometimes that love has to be re-earned. Sometimes you can't ever earn it. But perhaps you can plant a seed, and God will make that seed grow. Now, let's jump into this with a concrete example. And I'm going to use a contentious issue that's going around right now, so I apologize if any of you get upset with me. Let's talk about whether or not you should wear a mask. There are people in this room who think that no one needs to wear a mask, that this isn't important. There are other people in this room and watching online that might think everyone needs to wear a mask. We could jump back and forth saying, God doesn't call us to be afraid, and and then, but God does call us to be wise, and then, but here's a doctor who says what I believe, and then, but here's 12 articles that say what I believe. We could go back and forth and back and forth on this sort of thing. I've heard that argument playing for months now, so have all of you, I'm sure. Um, But the science of these masks is not that it protects you. The science of these masks is that it distorts the airflow as it comes out, so instead of streaming off towards someone else, it kind of swirls around you. And that's, that's how it protects others. The purpose of these masks is to protect others. I, I think that somewhere along the line, people must have tried to sell this mask wearing stuff by engaging our selfishness and triggering fear like you need to do it to protect yourself sort of thing but that's not how it works i wear a mask for you you wear a mask for me that's love that's love in action that's the most excellent way that paul tells us so fine you're not at risk but would you love someone else and wear a mask anyways fine you don't believe in the efficacy of masks but you are causing others to stumble in anger and fear, would you wear a mask anyways, out of love? If you're not worried, great. Would you wear a mask for someone else then and not for yourself? I think it gets hard for us to conceptualize why wearing a mask is an act of love because we might never meet the people that we're protecting. We will never get a thank you from that person. We will never be recognized because it's open-ended. We will never get a tally. And honestly, that makes love hard. Love is easiest when it's reciprocated, when I love you and you love me back. We also won't necessarily see the people that are hurt. Wearing a mask is uncomfortable, but it's not forever. 
And my mom just had a nine-hour surgery with three surgeons. And I bet she's thankful that those three surgeons were wearing masks. We do it for others. And on the other side of this, though, we're also called to love those who refuse to wear a mask. We're not called to react in anger and fear towards them. We're, act, we're called to extend love, to be gracious, to put them first, to put ourselves last. This is just one example, but this applies to everything. Your knowledge is not more important than your relationships. Am I my brother's keeper? Cain asked God in Genesis. Do I really need to be responsible for someone else? The answer has always been a resounding yes. It's not to say that we control other people's actions, but that we control our actions and we're cognizant about how they impact other people. It's that we are careful to love others, about using their freedoms to eat the meat. Paul says to the Corinthians, when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Yikes. Therefore, if food is the cause of their failing, I will never eat meat again, <laughs> so that I may not cause them to fall. You see, here, Paul is not trying to find the boundary line of what's okay and what's not okay, like how much can he get away with. Paul is saying, I will stay far away. If, if this is an issue that causes people to stumble, I won't even approach it. I will not go near that. This is the kind of radical love that God calls us to. It's in this context that Paul says one of my favorite verses in 1 Corinthians 10.31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Your love for your neighbor is to the glory of God. Your love for your neighbor is shown through these small everyday acts. It doesn't even have to be anything big. And that is to the glory of God. This is the message of 1 Corinthians. Remember, earlier we said that 1 Corinthians was about divisions and freedom. But we can also talk about it in opposite terms, unity and love. We should not be divided. We should have one mind and spirit, that of Christ. Freedom often serves us, or often severs us from our obligations to others. I'm free, so I don't have to worry about you. Love binds us to others as their servants. As good as knowledge can be, as good as a prophetic word can be, as good as freedom can be, all of it is worthless without love. In, Corinthi in 1 Corinthians 9, 19-23, Paul says, For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, but I'm under God's law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became like one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel so that I may share in its blessing. This is our call too. We have freedoms, we have knowledge, we have strength, but we are called to give it all up for the sake of love, for the sake of others. As Paul tells the Corinthians in chapter 11, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Let us follow the example of Christ in our lives. We're going to pray, and then I'd like all of you to sing a closing song with me. Let's pray. God, thank you for this time together with dear friends and new friends. Help us, God, to live our lives so that those people who are a stranger to love find us to be generous friends. God, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is sadness, joy. 
Grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Thank you, God. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. And together we'll spread the that God is in our land and they'll know we are Christians by our love by our love yes they'll know we are Christians by our love we will work with each other we will work side by side we will work with each other we will work side by side and we'll guard each man's dignity and save each man's pride and they'll know we are christians by our love by our love yes they'll know we are christians by our love all praise to the father from whom all things come and all praise to christ jesus And all praise to the Spirit who makes us one. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Amen. As you are dismissed, I remind you that there are offering boxes at the doors, or you can mail in uh, your tithes or sharing the word with us today, you are dismissed.